Hello, uh, and welcome to Doc Talk, sponsored by Grand Itasca Clinic and Hospital. My name is Bennett Mackey. I'm a third year medical student at the University of Minnesota. Hi, and I'm Emily Sarek. I am also a third year medical student at the University of Minnesota and an RPAP student at Grand Itasca. We'll be talking about blastomycosis, what it is, and how can you protect yourself. So blastomycosis is a fungal infection of the lung in humans and other animals. Uh, it is caused by the fungus blastomycosis dermatitidis. It is a dimorphic fungus, meaning that it has two forms. Uh, it acts as a mold in its natural habitat out in the environment and acts as a yeast when it is in the host, uh, that being either yourself or an animal. In its mold form, it is a multicellular filament uh, called hyphae and it reproduces by producing spores. The top picture in blue is the mold form. It kind of looks like lollipops on a string. The yeast form is a single celled microorganism and it rep reproduces by budding, which you can see in the pink and purple picture in your lower right hand corner. Where is blastomycosis located? Uh, it is, has a significant geographic distribution um, bordering the waterways of the St. Lawrence and Mississippi River systems. Uh, within North America, it is most prevalent in the Midwest, South Central, and Southeastern parts of the United States. Uh, ecologically, it is found in forested soils, also in decaying vegetation or organic material like a compost pile uh, within rotting wood. Um, it is also found in disruption of soil, uh, such as in construction sites, uh, compost piles like I previously mentioned, uh, also in bird poop. So, what is the prevalence of blastomycosis in Minnesota? Last summer, uh, the Department of Health had released a statement saying that there was a higher than expected number of blastomycosis cases uh, being reported, and this was likely due to favorable environmental conditions. If you recall, last summer it was a particularly wet summer with many humid days. Um, when looking at the Department of Health site, uh, the most recent data is the data from 2018, and there were 58 cases of blastomycosis. The median age of infection was 45 and a half years old, but the range was from 5 to 90. 35 of these cases were hospitalized for an average length of 7 days. 8 of those individuals died from blastomycosis, um, and of the 58 cases, 21 of them had immunocompromising health conditions such as diabetes, chronic steroid use, or medications for rheumatoid, rheumatoid arthritis, uh, which can affect the immune system. As you can see in this graph, uh, it is the distribution of cases over the last 20 or so years. Um, you can notice that the cases have started to gradually increase since 2014. This is also another graph of the data um, of human blastomycosis cases uh, representing the age of infection and it is most prevalent in the just age range of 41 to 50. And you can see in this graph as to which month blastomycosis are most often reported, uh, peaking in September and December. And there are specific reasons why this uh, can happen that I will talk about uh, momentarily. This graph of the distribution of cases by county shows that St. Louis and Itasca County have the most cases of blastomycosis over the last 20 years or so. So how, do, how does one get blastomycosis? Well, it is usually through an inhalation of the airborne spores, which are produced by the yeast form of the fungus. And those spores germinate in the lungs and become the mold. Now, the median incubation period for blastomycosis is roughly 45 days. So as you saw uh, several slides ago about the peak month uh, being September, it would 
lead one to believe that while you're out active, being in the woods, enjoying the summer months is when one might be more prone to contracting blastomycoses. Once it has infected the lungs, the fungus can then travel to any organ of the body. Um, it is important to note, though, that the fungus itself does not spread from animals to people or from person to person. So what should you do when you suspect you might have blastomycosis, or perhaps what should your provider do? So if you had been previously diagnosed with a pneumonia in the lung and your provider had prescribed you an antibiotic treatment and you weren't getting any better, maybe you would consider a diagnosis of blastomycosis. <clears throat> Additionally, if you had been working out in the woods or engaging in any activity disrupting soil um, prior to feeling unwell, you may want to consider blastomycosis. Now, that may be difficult for individuals who chronically work or work out in the woods and you're always exposed as opposed to it being a one-time experience and, well, maybe I can't remember what I was doing over a month and a half ago. Additionally, um, living in a geographic area where the disease occurs most frequently would, um, should raise the clinical suspicion uh, from your provider that maybe you might have blastomycosis. So how does one get diagnosed definitively with blastomycosis? So the definitive diagnosis, the gold standard, is that you are able to culture the fungus and the fungus will start to grow. Now growth can occur uh, in between five and 10 days, but it can take up to one month. So if it takes so long, how can I get maybe a more judicious or um, quicker result thinking that I may have blastomycosis? So there are several different mechanisms. You can have a presumptive diagnosis um, through sputum culture in which you can visualize on a slide uh, the mold. You can do biopsies of either skin or bone uh, of the bone marrow um, that Emily will talk about, the different manifestations of the disease. Or you can get it through purulent material, that being the, the sputum that you're coughing up or you're examining some pus from a skin lesion. Additionally, you can use urine uh, to diagnose the disease. Now you'd be thinking, well, that's kind of funny. Um, your body will actually produce antibodies to the fungus, and then you can use um, that antigen detection to see if you have been exposed to blastomycosis. So blastomycosis is known as the great pretender because it can infect any organ in the body and kind of present itself in any way. So like Bennett said, the onset of symptoms occur three weeks to three and a half months following inhalation of the mycelial fragments of, or spores. So little yeast fragments is kind of what the mycelial fragments mean. And then when you are symptomatic, 25 to 40% of patients will develop extra pulmonary dissemination, which means outside of the lungs. And then blastomyces can infect nearly, like I said, every organ in the body. So these are the most common sites of involvement, but like I said, it can be any organ. So pulmonary occurs 91% of the time, skin 18%, bone 4%, genital urinary 2%, and then your brain 1%. So pulmonary blastomycosis. So it's a pretty broad spectrum of disease in the lungs. So it can present as a subclinical pneumonia or it can um, progress to um, respiratory distress sy syndrome. So the most common sy um, symptom you would see would be a cough, but um, there's many others such as fever, sputum production, chest pain, shortness of breath, um, weight loss, night sweats, chills, and if hemoptysis or coughing up blood. On a chest x-ray, um, the, you can see a consolidation. It's the most common and it, um, it's hard to distinguish from a community acquired pneumonia. And then in ARDS or acute respiratory distress syndrome, um, about eight to 15% of hospitalized patients with pulmonary blastomycosis will um, progress to ARDS. Um, and it happens due to a delay in diagnosis of the blastomycosis induced ARDS um, due to a misdiagnosis of the community acquired pneumonia. 
And then mortality, unfortunately, is as great as 50%. But early diagnosis of blastomycosis-induced ARDS is critical to the disease um, mortality. So this is a chest x-ray um, of a progression of ARDS. So um, the one on the left is the beginning where if you see it um, becomes more and more um, like it's less clear and more hazy, um, that's the ARDS making the patient it difficult for them to breathe. Um, so if the pulmonary blastomycosis isn't treated right away, it can present um, as chronic pulmonary blastomycosis, and this is due to undiagnosis or untreated, and then it can cause a chronic pneumonia or ARDS, like I said before. It also, on chest x-ray, if it's chronic, it can mimic a lung neoplasm or TB or tuberculosis. Um, the chest x-ray is going to look like a cancer, so you'll see nodules, masses, or even cavitations. And due to the clinical picture being extremely broad, um, blastomycosis is not always included in the initial diagnosis or initial differential. So symptoms may present for several months, and patients can receive multiple rounds of antibiotics before this different um, before blastomycosis is considered. So cutaneous blastomycosis is the um, next most common extrapulmonary site of infection after the lungs. Um, Forty to eighty percent of patients um, with disseminated disease are going to have cutaneous blastomycosis. Um, it begins as a papular pustular lesion, which is an ulcerative lesion, or it can be crusted in appearance, and it also has irregular border, borders. Um, it can also become a plaque and like an abscess, and then it can lead to permanent scarring. It's mostly going to be found on the head and the extremities, but it can occur anywhere. Um, less likely than any other fungi to involve the mucous membrane, so it most likely won't be on your lips or nose. Um, so these are some pictures um, that of the lesions. Um, there you can see the one on the left behind the ear there, and then the one on the right is the most um, common picture that you can find online of it. it um, you can see it all over the arms and the chest and even on his face. So um, osseous or bone blastomycosis is the second most common after um, the skin. Um, it's only seen in 5 to 25 percent of patients. Um, they most, most likely also have the pulmonary blastomycosis when it, it does become, it does go into the bone. It can be very painful, so it's lytic destruction, so that means it's destroying the bone from the inside. Um, it can usually occurs in the long bone, so like your femur, um, vertebrae, as well as the skull and the ribs. It can mimic malignancy or cancer, and as well as POTS disease, which is a form of um, tuberculosis in your bones. Um, septic arthritis can occur, which is an infection in your joints, as well as um, pathological fractures from the bone breakdown, which just means that you can easily fracture your bone. And then genital urinary blastomycosis, this is pretty rare, but um, it can occur. So in males, you're going to see um, it in the prostate or the epididymis. In the prostate, you're going to have um, symptoms such as urinary obstruction, difficulty urinating, perineal or suprapubic discomfort, whereas if it occurs in the epididymis, you're going to have some scrotal swelling, pain, or even testicular enlargement. And in females, it has been found in tubo-ovarian abscesses, endometriitis, as well as salpingitis. And then lastly is the central nervous system blastomycosis. This occurs in less than 5 to 10 percent of immunocompetent patients. Um, it's usually due to blood spread or direct invasion through the skull osteomyelitis or a bone infection. It also can um, present such a, like meningitis, epidural abscesses, or brain abscesses. And then symptoms are um, such as headache, focal neurological deficits, confusion, visual disturbance, and seizures. And then an um, important um, population is immunocompromised hosts. So these are so the blastomycosis can um, present as an opportunistic pathogen. So this is like a um, pathogen that usually doesn't infect people who are healthy, but it infects people who are immunocompromised more. Um, it, one of the main um, populations is people who have HIV or AIDS when they have a um, low CD4 T cell count, which just means that their immune system is um, not working properly and their um, fighter cells are too low. 
Um, it also, it, in blastomycosis, they most likely have the severe pulmonary disease if they have HIV and AIDS, and but also you have to remember they can get CNS dissemination 40% of the time. And then other than um, HIV and AIDS patients, you can also have patients um, who are transplant recipients recipients and people on TNF-alpha inhibitors, like Bennett said, for like rheumatoid arthritis. And then pregnancy, it's another important group. Um, it's most frequently diagnosed in the second and third trimester. Um, and then pregnant women are more likely to have disseminated disease, um, like in the law or like in the skin or in the brain because of their depressed immunity. Um, placental involvement has been reported, um, but it, it's important to note that it does not increase risk for congenital malformations. But neonatal blastomycosis is rare, but it does become fatal. And this is due to the transmission either via transplacental or aspiration of infected vaginal secretions when the, um, when the fetus is um, going through the birth canal. And then treatment. So you would like, um, once you get diagnosed with it, um, usually your physician is gonna contact the infectious disease because um, they need to be involved. Um, it's, the treatment is based on the site and severity of infection and then the host's immune status and if you're pregnant or not. Antifungals are the treatment of choice, but you do wanna um, continue them for at least six months. Um, you will need baseline um, labs such as um, your blood count, your liver labs, and ki kidney function. And then also you want to see, um, have your physician know every drug you are on or medication because uh, um, a lot of the antifungals can interact with the um, certain drugs you're using. Like um, they can affect your heart. If you have congestive heart failure, it can affect um, one of the main drugs, can affect how well your heart pumps. can also um, affect a lot of people are on statins for cholesterol and it can affect the, um, how much of that statin is in your blood. But of note, pravastatin is excluded um, due to the way it's metabolized in your body. So amphotericin B is the um, first um, one of the main antifungals. It is used for severe pulmonary infection, disseminated disease, CNS involvement, and immunosuppression. It's the first line for neonates and pregnant women due to the side effect profile of the other ones, um, but it is nephrotoxic, so it affects your kidneys in 30% of patients. But um, that is minimized if the um, patient is giving um, IV fluids such as normal saline before and after treatment. But then you want to make sure the physician is monitoring your electrolytes with labs and um, your creatinine, which is a protein in your kidneys. The next um, treatment is triazoles. This is the most common, and it's called the main one is itroconazole, and it's the first line for mild to moderate non-CNS blastomycosis. So it's a, if it's in your brain, you want um, amphotericin B because that's what crosses the blood brain, brain barrier. And it's also used, um, the itraconazole is used for step-down therapy, so after amphotericin B use. But of note, if you're on H2 blockers or PPIs, which is used for GERD treatment, you need to take the itraconazole solution instead of the oral pill because it maximizes absor absorption due to the at to the um, decreased acidity in your stomach. You also will need LFTs, which is your liver um, function tests at baseline, as well as um, in two to four weeks into therapy and then every three months after due to the toxicity to your liver. So in conclusion, um, for prevention, it's um, no known practical measures or for prevention right now, there's no methods to test the soil for the presence, and then illness can be minimized by early recognition and appropriate treatment of the disease. But it's really important as why we do this presentation is to have continued awareness by both the public and healthcare providers, and it's key to both treatment and diagnosing the disease. Thank you for watching Doc Talk.